Lytton's on fire. We are following breaking news tonight out of Lytton, British Columbia village now possibly lost to a wildfire. The mayor says that everyone was ordered out as the flames moved in around five o'clock Pacific time. People there described it as a race against time. Tonight, CBC meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff will walk us through the science. Anita Bath has the reaction from the community. And we begin this hour with Katie Nicholson, who's been tracking the latest developments. Katie? Yeah, we've been speaking to Cheryl James. She's one of the people who, you know, had 15 minutes to to gather her things and hop in a car and make that split uh, second decision. She and her daughter are in Lillooet. They're with 30 other people from the community in a rec center. Cheryl says that she left her, her son behind. He is one of the firefighters there in the community. He is still there. She hasn't heard from him. She's very worried about him. This all happened so quickly. First, there was smoke, and literally within 15 minutes, according to Mayor Jan Polderman, there was fire engulfing everything in the, in the town, in the village. Uh, the winds have been quite strong at this point. It was just a perfect storm of dry temperatures and powerful winds stoking up that fire and pushing it literally quite toward the, the, uh, the village. 70 kilometer an hour winds south by southwest. That was the direction that it needed to go to consume the village. And that's indeed what happened. Here is the mayor. The, um, the whole town is on fire. I've ordered, I've ordered the town evacuated, and I've told everyone as I was leaving town to leave. It took like a whole 15 minutes from, you know, the first sign of smoke to all of a sudden there being fire, you know, everywhere. So, Ian, I think you can hear the emotion there. That's something that, uh, you know, we've registered in speaking to all the other evacuees. Um, there is shock, there is terror, there is worry, uh, and there is deep sadness that, that this has happened to their town. They have no idea what they have left uh, or what they'll come back to or if there will be anything to come back to. We know that people have uh, gone to, in, in multiple directions. I mean, it all happened so quickly. It's not like there was a plan. So some people went north, some people went south. We know there are highway closures. We've seen some riveting videos as well um, of fire all along the road. It calls to mind uh, some of the escape videos we've seen of evacuations from, from Fort McMurray. So, uh, you know, this is indeed a very serious situation. We know it is a serious situation. We've been told this for days now by conservation and forestry experts that there were tinder dry con conditions, that these, we were in an extreme fire danger zone right now. And, and that is certainly evident. This is what has unfolded this evening with this rapid consumption uh, of this village. Uh, you know, I've also been speaking with firefighters um, working municipally. Uh, we know that there are uh, there is a call out now for for municipal firefighters to help to sort of shore up some of these inland fires. There are about 41 fires right now burning in the province, and of course we know 26 of those sparked up just in the last two days. All right, Katie Nicholson, thank you very much. And it is a scenario, as you say, we've heard about uh, in other wildfires in places like Slave Lake and Fort McMurray where people just jump in their cars, uh, grab a bag if they can, sometimes not even that, and not sure when they come back to their community whether their house will still be standing. Uh, let's turn now to uh, Anita Bath, another one of our reporters who's live here in the newsroom. You've been working the phones, reaching out to the community, and what are you hearing? Well, Ian, what you're talking about there is that adrenaline that people feel in these types of situations, trying to get out as fast as they can. So a lot of the people we spoke with early uh, early on this evening were really feeling that sense of panic, trying to escape those flames, some driving through the town and seeing, you know, a hotel on fire, other structures on fire around them, worried that those flames would catch up to them. But we spoke to a woman named Edith who once that 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 uh, adrenaline kind of went away and she was able to really process what had happened she was in tears it was really heartbreaking and she spoke about having to leave all of her belongings in particular her photo albums and when we've covered wildfires in the past that's often what people talk about their photo albums all of their memories that they're leaving behind and they're really just feeling that heartbreak tonight of having to do that and let's talk about another angle of uh, the sort of broader story, not uh, specifically dealing with Lytton, but throughout British Columbia. And it's been not just the brutally hot 
days, but also the dangerously hot situations. Absolutely. In fact, we had 486 sudden deaths over the last five days. And to put that into perspective, that's a 195% increase from the average number of deaths around this time, which is usually about 165. Now, when authorities went and found these people, they say they were hot, they were unventilated, and they were usually at home alone. And we are expecting that number, that 486, to increase significantly because that doesn't account for numbers uh, of people who died today and we heard from RCMP that there were several of them as well. So really this heat has been absolutely dangerous and it's also pushing our emergency health system to the brink. We heard about people waiting four hours for an ambulance. A woman we spoke with earlier was trying to get her grandmother to hospital. Her grandmother stopped breathing and luckily was able to get her breath back and they ended up having to drive her to the hospital because even after that four hours no ambulance came. They were worried she would pass away. Luckily, she didn't, but that's sort of the situation we're dealing with here. And once you do get to hospital, a lot of the emergency rooms are overrun with people dealing with heat exhaustion. All right, Anita Bath, thank you very much. Earlier this evening, I spoke to Lytton Town Councillor Robert Leach, who described what happened when the fire moved into the community in late afternoon. About quarter after five or around that time, uh, there was a fire that started at the south end of the village. Um, I was home at the time and I saw lots of smoke coming up and I knew this was right in town. And uh, within 15 minutes, it was basically 100 metres from my house. And so, I mean, I guess you, you, you took off next, but what did you see? Is that the point at which you left town or, or just left your house? Yeah. Um, so uh, when when the uh, smoke just get, get, kept getting closer and it was getting blacker and darker, um, we just basically pulled up the truck and just put everything into the truck and knocked on neighbors' doors. And by the time we were in the truck leaving, there was uh, flames we could see within 100 meters of the house. That's how fast it moved. Yeah, I mean, it sounds uh, frightening. How did it feel to be to be in the middle of all of that? Well, um, it was just it was just a bit of a panic, but at the same time, it's like you just need to get yourself out. That's how fast it was. Get your pets, get all your valuables, get your neighbors, just get out of the neighborhood. That's what you needed to do. So you went north on the highways you mentioned to to the town yep. of Ashcroft, and uh, are, right. I, I assume you're seeing a lot of people from Lytton who are there. We are. Yes, we did. We saw uh, some uh, people that lived down the street from us. Um, they told me that their house was completely gone. They were near the beginning of the fire where it started. And the devastation on their face just says it all, that, you know, your house, all your possessions, everything is gone. What yeah. do you know about what's happening in Lytton right now? First of all, just physically, what the, the status is of the buildings in town right now? To be honest, um, I'm not really sure what's happening in Lytton, um, other than what a few neighbours have told us, that some structures are burnt. Um, along the highway here in, in Ashcroft, we've seen six or seven RCMP rushing towards Lytton. Um, that's probably because the road closures or the fire is just rapidly spreading, even at this hour because of the wind. Are you hearing anything about uh, the, the status? You know, I asked about building, buildings before, about uh, people in Lytton. Uh, did everybody get out? Um, not really sure. Um, it was a very quick 15-minute grab your stuff, go. You, ha you didn't really have a lot of chance to think about a lot of things other than just Get yourself out of there. So, town councillor from Lytton, who we spoke to a couple of hours ago around 8 o'clock Pacific time. As you can see, CBC News meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff has been with us throughout this breaking news coverage. Uh, Johanna, the weather station uh, went down in the Lytton area hours ago uh, due, due to a power outage, perhaps. What is the situation mm -hmm. now? Well, Ian, uh, this is uh, the last of the light across BC uh, as we head into the late evening hours. And I'm looking at nearby stations. It looks like Kamloops, uh, closest uh, station to the northeast of Lytton, still reporting gusts 
of up to 50 kilometers per hour. Uh, temperatures are still over 30 degrees as we head into evening hours. I mean, Lytton is the location of Canada's new all-time temperature record uh, for three days running, but Lytton has been experiencing high 40 degree temperatures for five days. Uh, and the reason Lytton is often the hot spot is the same reason we're seeing these incredible wind gusts. Uh, this is the last capture from the weather station, uh, seeing gusts up to 70 kilometers per hour before it went offline, just as the rest of the power uh, to the village did. Uh, it's in the Fraser Canyon. That's where it basically Lytton can bake. It's also where the winds rush through the valley. So that's why we're seeing these very strong southwesterly winds uh, pushing potentially uh, a second fire that popped up earlier today. That's what we're hearing uh, towards the village, uh, possibly at speeds of up to 20 kilometers per hour. That's how fast this fire was moving, Ian. And the heat dome finally uh, moved out. The temperature is moderate. Well, I don't know if we'd say moderating, but reduced a little bit. But uh, with the change in weather, actually more bad news. Yeah, you said it. As this heat dome shifts eastward over the Rockies, it's opening the door to uh, this refreshing marine air here in Vancouver. But instability for the interior. I've just got to show you. This is a, a look at the latest lightning detection map. Uh, these are live lightning strikes happening across uh, BC right now. Uh, these are thousands of lightning strikes traveling up through uh, central and northern British Columbia in this tinderbox dry condition. A lot of these storms, Ian, also elevated, uh, meaning uh, we're getting the winds and the lightning strikes uh, but not a ton of rain so the big concern Ian uh, we could be looking at dozens if not uh, you know possibly hundreds of new fire start starts through the overnight just talking to a, a fire scientist uh, this evening just a moment ago and he said the message uh, for communities right across the interior this early on in the season is everyone needs to have an evacuation plan it's great having you along with us for this coverage tonight Joe thank you very much you're welcome and Tanya Fletcher is uh, with us as well this evening, and she's been reaching out for official reaction and information on this fire. And, and Tanya, what do you have? Yeah, Ian, I reached out to the Premier's office. They say all of government is focused uh, on this horrible situation right now and that emergency crews are doing everything we can. Premier John Horgan also sent out this tweet just moments ago saying the fire situation is extremely dangerous right now. Emergency crews are doing everything they can to support the people of Lytton. Please follow the latest updates from, you can see the uh, official emergency info BC in the BC Wildfire Service there. Um, I'm also told that Premier Horgan is receiving constant briefings on the evolving situation in Lytton and the province, uh, all the fires around the province, and that all resources are being employed to support the people of Lytton right now. We've also heard from the local MLA for the area that she sent out a tweet, Jackie Taggart, we think we have it here. She says, hearing reports of catastrophic damage to the town of Lytton, praying everyone has made it out safely. I'm waiting for a briefing from BC Wildfire Service and we'll share new information as it's made available. So that's the latest from provincial officials there as we still await word from RCMP as well. And Tanya, it was just a couple of days ago you were, were reporting how the province of British Columbia was, uh, you know, giving some good news about how the, the, the pandemic, uh, you know, the case counts were down, restrictions, many restrictions were being lifted. But now with this new crisis, with the heat even before the fire, uh, new pressures on the provincial government. Absolutely, and the province has been facing increasing criticism as they were, you know, doing a victory lap, as some say, with the COVID response and how we're reopening. And yet at the same time, this heat wave had already been in place for several days. And BC's public safety minister faced some of those questions today. And, you know, he was asked, you know, why the province wasn't perhaps better prepared or providing some of these critical information and communication services earlier on. Their answer was essentially that this is something that is unprecedented in BC. They were asked if they were caught flat footed. He didn't outrightly admit to that or, or accept that notion. He said, you know, a lot of this onus is on the communities as well. They will be waiting for recommendations that come from a report from the BC Coroner Service looking into this sudden spike in sudden deaths uh, over the past five days. And uh, they do say they will be doing an overhaul of the Emergency Program Act, that legislation in the province and the heat and all of the implications that come along with it will be a part of that and contribute to that overhaul. So that's where the province stands at this point, but it's not just about one singular wildfire here. Of course, this is uh, encapsulates the whole heat wave, the wildfires, the deaths and the tragedy we've seen across this province. And this will be something, an issue that they're pressed on for weeks and months to come, Ian. All right, Tanya, thank you very much. 
Now, the heat dome that contributed to the situation in Lytton is currently hovering over Alberta, where people are scrambling to try to find ways to keep cool and safe as the temperature rises. Carolyn Dunn now with what doctors there are seeing. Tana Horsfall was thrilled to find a place to fill her water bottle on a Calgary city street. She's experiencing homelessness and says places like corner stores are simply not an option for her. Then they're like, do you have money? Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And like sometimes the guys would steal the water and I don't want to do that. Volunteers are trying to go where the most vulnerable people are. There's going to be a lot of people and going to be ending up in the hospital and being really, really sick from this because they don't, some of them don't know how to look after themselves. In the last 24 hours, dozens of ambulances were dispatched to deal with patients suffering from the heat. And Alberta hospitals had more than 60 heat-related visits. We're seeing all sorts of things. We're seeing bad sunburns, but we're also seeing a little uptick in kidney stones and gout attacks as people get dehydrated. And of course, we are starting to see some heat exhaustion. Hotels around the province are doing brisk business with people who can afford to pay for a reprieve from the sustained heat. And every guest calling in for a reservation asks the same thing. The first question is, uh, do you have air conditioning? Uh, and the second question is almost immediately, uh, does it work? But AC is a luxury many people cannot afford. So as a growing number of Alberta communities break historic records for all-time highs, people are coping however they can. Sydney Gray can't even find a fan to purchase. So she's been resorting to cold towels to keep her son Carson comfortable. There's only so much I can do to try and keep him cool because we don't have central air, we don't have AC, and we currently don't have any fans. And at least another day of stifling and potentially dangerous temperatures in the forecast. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. And we want to show you some video just into our newsroom tonight showing some frightening moments apparently as people are driving out of uh, the area where the wildfire was spreading. Oh my God, look at that. Jesus. We're actually doing, our house is actually doing pretty well so far. Holy shit, that's fun. This is uh, reminiscent of, of something we've been talking about before, and that is the video that uh, people were taking as they fled Slave Lake and uh, Fort McMurray, two huge wildfires in Alberta. And, uh, you know, you heard it in the sound of the people inside that car, and you can just imagine as you look at this uh, video what it must be like to leave and not know what's at the end of that uh, smoke and when we talked to the town councillor from Lytton he mentioned that even when he was what about an hour's drive away uh, in safety that the air quality there in Ashcroft started to look a lot like it looked in Lytton when he uh, decided that it was time to flee. Again here's another uh, shot of uh, the, the smoke from a bit of a distance of Lytton and what we're still waiting for at this hour this evening is a sense of what is happening or what has happened in the village of Lytton itself. We heard the mayor saying that it was a dire situation. He, he said that the, the entire village was on fire. What we have not had from any official sources so far this evening is any confirmation of the, uh, the extent of the structural damage to Lytton or also the all clear that everyone made it out safely. Still waiting for uh, official word on those two very important issues. Now for those of you who may be watching affected by the evacuation and the fire and need help, here's an emergency number that you can contact. It's the Thompson Nicola Regional District Emergency Operations Center. And I'm going to read the numbers that are on the screen right now. 250-377-7188 or toll-free 1-866-377-7188. We'll be back with more on The National after this. After days of record breaking heat in Lytton, British Columbia, a devastating turn of events this evening, a wildfire spreading to the village as residents fled. So lots of stories to cover here on The National tonight and uh, here's Andrew in our Toronto studio.
big story that we have been following is how in the days and weeks since the discovery of unmarked graves at former residential schools across Canada, how a number of Catholic churches have been burned with no one claiming responsibility. Last night, another church went up in flames, this time one not on Indigenous land. Oh, it's going to crash. Oh, it is crashing. Emergency crews were called to St. John Baptiste Parish at about 3 in the morning in the small town of Morinville, just north of Edmonton. But with flames already raging, there was little they could do but contain the scene. Speaking earlier today, Morinville's mayor was clearly shaken. We need to deal with the shock and have an opportunity to grieve the loss to our community. Visiting those charred ruins this afternoon, Alberta Premier Jason Kenney took a sharper line. We all know that Canada has to redouble its efforts at reconciliation, but these acts of violence and intimidation is not reconciliation. It's not the way forward. Police have not announced an official cause, but are investigating the possibility of arson, and St. John Baptiste Parish was not the only Canadian Catholic church to burn overnight. Nova Scotia RCMP are looking into a suspicious fire that damaged a Catholic church on Sabaganagate First Nation. That would make six Catholic churches that have burned in recent days. Meanwhile, yet another First Nation has announced the discovery of unmarked graves near a former residential school, again using ground-penetrating radar, this time near Cranbrook, B.C., Here's Olivia Stefanovic on what we know and how it may affect the push for an apology from the Pope himself. Childhood items line the entrance of the former St. Eugene Mission Residential School, honoring the nearby discovery of 182 unmarked shallow graves. It, it's just, um, it, it's devastating. It's unclear exactly who was buried here, children or adults, or how or when they died. But what is clear, the revelation is igniting further anger and calls for action. There are living um, priests, nuns and staff that were had a hand in this, then find them. The Prime Minister says there needs to be accountability. Governments have the role to play and the Justice Department no doubt will have its role to play as well. But Justin Trudeau also says the Roman Catholic Church, which ran St. Eugene's, needs to take responsibility. That's what people are expecting. I think it is a good uh, piece of news that there are going to be meetings with Indigenous leaders uh, with uh, His Holiness. A delegation of Indigenous people will travel to the Vatican in December, seeking an official papal apology in Canada for the church's role in running residential schools. The Anglican Church has apologized. The Presbyterian Church has apologized. The United Church has apologized. Uh, and this is really part of truth and be part of the healing and reconciliation process. Catholic entities in Canada have apologized, but the Vatican remains the only holdout. The current uh, uh, climate in Canada relative to the uh, uncovery of grave sites and whatnot has heightened interest all the way around. A national outpouring of grief continues at memorials like this one. The president of the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops says Pope Francis is open to delivering an apology in Canada at an opportune time. When that moment will be, he wouldn't say. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, Ottawa's virtual Canada Day celebrations will go ahead tomorrow, even as some communities across the country cancel their events in solidarity with Indigenous people. Today, the Prime Minister said both are okay. All Canadians, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, need to take tomorrow, yes, to celebrate the country that we are, but also to reflect on all the work we need to continue to do and understand with respect and compassion that some of our fellow Canadians don't feel like celebrating tomorrow. The Prime Minister has also requested the flag at the Peace Tower be lowered to half-mast to honor Indigenous children who died in residential schools. Well, Bill Cosby is no longer behind bars tonight. His conviction for sexual assault overturned by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Jacqueline Hansen has the details of the stunning reversal and the response from Cosby's most prominent accuser. This was more than two years ago. Bill Cosby cuffed and sent to prison. His fall from grace as America's TV dad broadcast across the world. Now he's free. He just said his heart was racing. He couldn't believe it. 
Cosby was convicted of drugging and sexually assaulting Canadian Andrea Constant. She initially reported the assault in 2005, a year after it happened. That delay is part of why a U.S. district attorney released a public statement saying he wouldn't charge Cosby criminally. So Constant pursued a civil case in which Cosby had to testify. He basically gave up his right to remain silent and not implicate himself based on the promise that it wouldn't be used against him in criminal court. In his deposition, Cosby said he had offered drugs to women he wanted to have sex with. When those comments were made public, a new district attorney decided to charge him. Judges on Pennsylvania's Supreme Court now say that was unfair. The success of this appeal does not challenge Ms. Constan's story. It does not exonerate Mr. Cosby's behavior. All it says is this case was legally flawed. Is this a blow to the Me Too movement? I, I, it's not a win. In a statement, Constant called the decision disappointing and said she's concerned this could discourage other women from seeking justice. I would urge people to look at this decision from a constitutional lens and not from a lens of sexual assault. This lawyer says culturally a lot has changed since the DA questioned Constance's delay. Now a district attorney might look at those circumstances and say, this is how victims respond in this type of situation. It's not atypical and it's not a mark against our victims' credibility. Today's decision also means Cosby can't be tried for this particular case again. But there are dozens of other women who claim he's guilty of more. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. So just a few of the stories we've been following tonight. But uh, Ian, of course, the most urgent, much closer to where you are in British Columbia. And here in the newsroom in Vancouver, Andrew, we continue to work the phones to get information about what's happened to the village of Lytton and to hear from people who fled the wildfires. That is coming up later on The National. Lytton's on fire. And we continue to follow the breaking news tonight out of Lytton, B.C. After days of the highest temperatures ever recorded in Canada, a wildfire swept into the village as residents fled. The, um... The whole town is on fire. I've ordered, I've ordered the town evacuated, and I've told everyone as I was leaving town to leave. It took like a whole 15 minutes from, you know, the first sign of smoke to all of a sudden there being fire, you know, everywhere. Katie Nicholson is one of our journalists working this story. She's in our newsroom here in Vancouver. And what's the latest information you have? You know, we've been speaking with Cheryl James. She's one of the many evacuees who went to Lillooet. So she and about 30 others are in a recreational center there. And, you know, when this happened, um, she had a brief conversation with her son, who's on the, the local fire department um, at Lytton. And, you know, he said, you go, you go. Uh, and she took her daughter and, and left him behind. And she's hasn't heard from him since um, you know she's been in Lytton now for or she's rather been in Lillooet for a couple of hours and hasn't heard any word yet about her son she's very worried about him because of course we have seen how devastating the and, and how fast moving that fire is here is Cheryl Pardon James me. scared he told me to leave And I told him he better not stay too late. Now, James is there with, again, her daughter and actually her boss and his wife, some of the people who sort of went that way up north to Lillooet. There are others who went to Merritt. Um, we're hearing that some people dispersed to, to Kamloops. You know, it really was just sort of a panic situation. You have 15 minutes, 15 minutes from when the smoke became really bad to the town becoming engulfed in flames. So, you know, we are hearing about people just, just not even processing this yet, but also there's that fear, there is grief, and that uncertainty as to what is left behind. Is anything left behind? Uh, you know, I've been also speaking with, uh, with firefighters. We know the call has gone out uh, to municipal firefighters. There are about 40 more 
than 41 uh, fires raging in the province right now. Uh, and 26 of those had started in the last two days, all attributed to these super tender, dry conditions uh, that came out of the heat dome. So, you know, there are going to be more people out there uh, in the trenches, so to speak. Uh, and, you know, that is also, a, it's an elaborate, uh, it's an elaborate thing to try to plan resource-wise. You've got to get water out there. You've got to be careful with the heat exhaustion for the crews who are out there. Uh, so, you know, there is a, a massive effort underway. Uh, and, you know, we know that these, the, the conditions right now, so extreme for fire danger uh, that this is an unfolding story that we're going to have to just keep watching. Uh, and, you know, there is there is fear all around uh, in, in these communities tonight um, for those who have fled and and those who are, are still smelling smoke, uh, even in the communities where they have moved to. All right, Katie, thank you very much. You're welcome. Imagine having to leave your home in as little as 15 minutes what do you even grab and what do you think when you're not sure what's going to be there when you get back? So a lot of people tonight in British Columbia in different places, as Katie mentioned, after they fled Lytton, one of them, uh, Bernice Abbott. Uh, she joins me from the evacuation center in Lillooet. Uh, Bernice, thanks for joining us. Uh, first of all, how are you feeling tonight? Um, anxiety is high. Um... You know, we're still trying to get a hold, get a con get into contact with family and friends. Um, uh, we're here at the Lillooet Community Centre and uh, people are coming in and they're, you know, signing in their name and there's they're a number that they can be reached at. Um, the community here has been very supportive and um, we've got um, donations of clothes, towels, beds, blankets, tents. They've got food here for us, um, snacks, toys, books for the kids. Um, I looked at the list and there's probably about two people who've already signed in already, um, leaving their name and number for contact. Mm -hmm. So were you in Lytton when the fire hit? Um, well, it's been burning for a couple of days and then we went, my family and I, we went out of town and um, when we got back to Lytton, um, yeah, the, the village of Lytton itself was engulfed in flames. Um, we got home, we had about 15 minutes to grab whatever we could and leave. So, so how, how do you, what do you decide to do in that situation, Bernice? 15 minutes, what did you take? I immediately went and got all our, our ID. I, have, I had it all in one place, so I had the kids' ID. And um, the kids just got back from being at a relative's house, so they had their, bag, their bags packed already. So it was a matter of just... Uh, my partner and I get in our, our bags and, and going. And you know, as we're talking to you, we're, we're watching some video taken presumably by someone else. They're, they're driving along the, the road and, uh, and it's really smoky and you can see buildings on fire. Describe for us what you saw in Lytton as you left. The community was engulfed by flames and smoke, and you couldn't really see what was burning. But you, you know, it's it's homes, it's businesses, and there's so much on Facebook, so many videos and everything, and it's devastating. Do you think your house is intact, or or what do you think the status of your home is? Um, from what I've heard, it sounds like my house should be okay, but, you know, you never know if the wind changes, but that could change. And so, where will your family be sleeping tonight? I am not sure. Well, we wish we've, you... Um, we've grabbed some uh, sleeping bags and they have um, mattresses and air mattresses uh, set up all around the, the gym here. So some people might be sleeping here. 
Well, it's a tough night, obviously, for a lot of people, including you and your family. And uh, I appreciate mm -hmm. you uh, speaking with us this evening, Bernice. Thank you very much, and, and I wish you luck. I, I hope you, your house obviously uh, came through this okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Good night. Yeah, good night. You're watching The National on CBC Television, CBC News Network. We'll be back after this. Welcome back to our breaking news coverage of the wildfire in and around Lytton, British Columbia. Still waiting for word on the extent to which the structures in Lytton were damaged. But as we heard earlier from the mayor, he described the entire village as being engulfed by fire. Earlier this evening, I spoke to Brad Viz, the uh, MP for Mission Matsqui Fraser Canyon, who shared with us what he knows of what was happening there, including what evacuees should be doing. The situation's really dire, and the Mayor Polderman, uh, on, in a matter of 15 minutes, had to get out of town and issue an evacuation alert. Uh, I've been working closely with the TNRD this evening. Uh, we, were we were successful in getting an alert out. Uh, TNRD was successful in getting an alert out recently to let people know uh, who evacuated Lytton to head over to Merritt on Coldwater Road to the evacuation center and to register. So right now, in real time, people are just doing everything possible to make sure that everyone is safe from the village of Lytton and the Lytton First Nation as well. And so those initials you mentioned are the, the regional district, which is basically the, the equivalent of the, the municipal uh, government in that area. And, uh, and, and, you know, a lot of people from British Columbia who are watching this now uh, are, are, you know, concerned about this fire. And, and there's some very basic questions, and maybe you have some information on this. First of all, what about the village of Lytton itself? What is the extent of the damage there? The extent of the damage is still ongoing, but what I've heard uh, from the TNRD is that it's very bad. And uh, I've been hearing from constituents directly, too, who have already lost their homes. The situation really is dire, Ian. And, and what about the status of people who were there? Are, are, you, are, are the authorities confident that, that everyone got out safely? Uh, I don't have up-to-date information. Uh, all I can say, uh, what I've been told, is that the situation is dire, and they're trying. The authorities are trying to account for everyone right now, and that's why it's really important that all evacuees go to Merit to register um, as soon as possible to get online and follow what the TNRD is saying uh, to make sure that authorities can account for everyone in this situation right now. Brad Viss is the MP for the region. It's actually a pretty big riding, but includes the Lytton area, and he spoke to us from Abbotsford tonight. And the emergency number for anyone who may need help, but also for people just to register so that loved ones know that they're safe and sound, the Thompson-Nicola Regional District Emergency Operations Centre, on your screen, but I'll read it out loud, 250-377-7188 or one 866 377-7188. So behind this heat has been the deadly impact across much of Western Canada is, is the heat dome. That's the term that meteorologists have been using. But what exactly is a heat dome? And what combination of factors led to this unprecedented weather event? Here's our meteorologist, Johanna Wagstaff, with the answers. If you are feeling the unprecedented heat in Canada right now, you're probably wondering why. Why is this happening? It's a heat dome, and that's standard for summer, but there are four main ingredients to why this pressure cooker is breaking records. First, recent storms in the Western Pacific. That created a wave in this atmospheric conveyor belt called the jet stream. And look at this movement of water vapor from space. You can see once that wave got to BC, it parked itself there, ushering in moisture, giving BC a humidity it usually doesn't feel. The effect was also felt far higher, melting snow and ice on the tops of our highest mountains. So that's hot. It gets hotter with thermal lows. When it's hot enough, rapidly rising air causes low pressure on the ground. Winds move from high to low, so that hot air rushes towards the coast, racing down our mountains. If you've heard of Chinooks, it's the same principle. Third, 
cooking time. This weather pattern got locked in place, allowing hot air to keep mixing down, making every day hotter than the next. The final ingredient, time of the year. It's June, meaning a higher sun angle and more hours of the day, but also it's what's not here this time of the year. Smoke from forest fire season would actually have helped dissipate the rays from the sun. So what does all of this have to do with climate change? Well, remember the jet stream? Normally it looks like this, helping to keep weather patterns moving around the world. But now it's even wavier, and that leads to weather events lasting longer and moving slower. As climate change rapidly warms the Arctic, it's making that warp worse. The temperature difference between the north and the south is getting smaller, and it's that difference that fuels the speed of the jet stream. We know that climate change is also moving the baseline. As average temperatures go up, it means these extreme weather events we're feeling are going to be back stronger and more often. Johanna Wagstaff, CBC News, Vancouver. And we'll have more on the latest information about the Lytton wildfire after the break. Harrowing pictures out of Lytton, B.C. as residents escaped a fast-moving wildfire. About 250 people live in the village, and it's been under an extreme heat warning for the last few days. Anita Bath has been working the phones for us from the newsroom this evening, and you've heard some stories about the chaos as people tried to get out. Yeah, chaos and panic is really the best words to describe the situation, Ian. You know, that evacuation order came down and people were told that they needed to get out. Some were able to grab belongings, others got nothing and just drove the heck out of town. Uh, you know, they described to me driving through the town and seeing some of those structures in flames, worried that those flames would catch up to them and driving as fast as they could. One woman we spoke with, she was completely in tears. She talked about the sadness that comes with losing her photo albums, all of those memories that she created over the years. She wasn't worried about any other belongings. It was really all of those pictures that, that tie her to the community. And you know, Ian, we see all of the footage and, and the photos of the flames and it's horrifying for us here in the CBC Vancouver News studios. But imagine those people watching those videos and watching the flames in real time, watching their town burn down and the feelings of sadness that they're getting tonight with all of that. And Anita, what have you learned about uh, where the evacuees are and, and what they need tonight? At this point, we know that some have gone to Hope, but for the most part, people have gone to Kamloops, Merritt, and Lillooet. And these are the centers set up by two of the tribal councils in the area who say they're quite upset. They feel like they haven't gotten a lot of help. Now, they are asking for supplies tonight. They want food. They say they need water, clothing, and especially shelter. They also really need volunteers to help process all of these evacuees and match them with hotels and other accommodation. Uh, overall, they're just really frustrated tonight and they're looking for help, Ian. All right, Anita, thank you very much. And we'll be back right after this. Welcome back. The village of Lytton, the same place that broke all-time Canadian heat records this week, has been hit hard by a wildfire. It swept in quickly this afternoon, forcing residents to grab what they could and flee. Katie Nicholson has been leading our coverage tonight. And Katie, even at this late hour, very little information from official sources. What are some of the key unanswered questions? I mean, first of all, safety. Did everybody make it out okay? Uh, because people scattered in the wind, uh, they had so little time to get on the road and they basically went off in all directions. There has to be a full accounting uh, for who is where? Is everybody safe? Was anybody left behind? Also, what is left of, of of the town itself, of Lytton. Are there buildings still intact? Um, is there anything to be salvaged? Is there anything left? What is the extent of the damage there? Certainly the pictures we saw were very dramatic, a very fast moving fire. And, and then finally, it's the fire itself. What is going to develop overnight? Will it be contained or will the weather conditions, which have been so favorable for this fire, allow it to continue to push forward and spread? So these are the key questions that we're, we're hoping to be able to answer in the coming hours and days.
All right, Katie, thank you very much. And of course, as we speak, this is a dynamic situation with firefighters on the job and police officers presumably trying to make sure that no people were left inside the village. And really important piece of information we heard earlier from the area's MP, if you have left your home, make sure you let authorities know that no matter where you are tonight so that they know who's accounted for. This is The National for June 30th. You can continue to find the latest breaking news on the situation in Lytton on cbcnews.ca. Good night.